Um, so, yes, yeah, so my name is uh, Guillaume Bourg. Uh, I'm actually uh, an associate professor in human genetics here at McGill, and I'm also the director of bioinformatics at the Genome Center, uh, which is not too far uh, either. So, uh, if you're not from Montreal, welcome to Montreal. Uh, as you see, we're very clean people, so we, you know, we get rid of anything that uh, is left behind. Um, okay, so uh, yesterday, uh, so you, you had an overview of, of uh, ChIP-seq in particular with, uh, with, with Martin and Misha. So today uh, I'm going to start and, and cover uh, methylation and in particular whole genome bisulfite sequencing. Um, well, well, we'll see this figure again and I'll, I'll, at that point I'll explain more what, uh, what this figure represents. Um, so, so we have plenty of time in this uh, morning session, so feel free to, to ask questions along the way. Um, but uh, the learning objectives of this, uh, of this section, of this module, uh, is to understand a bit on the different uh, technology used to measure DNA methylation. So even though we're going to focus on uh, next generation sequencing and whole genome bisulfide sequencing, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll first start by, by sort of uh, reviewing what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches, uh, in particular microarray approaches as well. Uh, after that, uh, we'll, we'll go over the bisulfite sequencing workflow. Uh, so you'll see that there's some interesting twists in terms of the bioinformatic analysis of these uh, methylation data sets. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's one of the most uh, unusual, I would say, uh, next generation sequencing analysis because of the way uh, the DNA is actually modified uh, in the process, as we'll see. Uh, so understanding the principle and the challenges of uh, methylation analysis, uh, be able to extract uh, methylation levels from bisulfite sequencing data, uh, know how to visualize uh, bisulfite sequencing data. So in this uh, section and this module, Especially in the practical, we'll be using IGV, so the uh, integrated genome uh, viewer, to, to really look at some of the files. So slightly different than uh, what you saw yesterday, which were mostly uh, UCSC genome browser tracks. So here we'll actually retrieve the data uh, locally uh, and visualize and explore the data. Um, and then uh, be able to identify differentially methylated regions. So this will cover uh, in the lecture, not as much um, in the practical, um, but, but at least uh, we'll cover it a bit in the lecture so that uh, you have a sense of what, how you identify differentially methylated regions. Okay, so starting with the, with the very basics. Uh, so what is DNA methylation? Uh, so we'll focus uh, today on the most common form of DNA methylation, which is really the 5-methyl cytosine methylation. Uh, so it affects, in, you know, 70 to 80 percent of especially CPGs, so, uh, so Cs that are in the CG uh, dinucleotide in the human genome. Uh, and, and sort of the basic uh, principle is really that high level of, of this 5-methyl uh, cytosine methylation in CP rich region promoters is associated with repression. So if you have high methylation of promoters, especially in uh, CPG rich regions or islands, uh, that's associated with repression. Uh, in, when there's no CG, uh, CPG uh, dense region, the relationship is a little bit more, more tricky in the context of transcription. But uh, again, the, the types of examples we'll see are really looking at hypo and hypermethylated uh, promoters. Uh, and, and again, we'll, we'll get back to that and look at that in more detail. Um, but what is, uh, the, the, what type of methylation are we talking about here? So uh, there's, there's uh, sometimes, and in the ChIP-seq uh, lecture yesterday, we were talking more about uh, histone marks and, and, and uh, so the histone tails that can also be methylated and have different marks. Here we're really talking about uh, the DNA methylation. So uh, the cytosines in the genome, in some case, have uh, through these uh, DNA methyl transferase have the addition of this this uh, this methyl group, and so that's really uh, what we're able to to well what we're going to be analyzing and looking at uh, today. But you'll see that in some case there are similarities between. Uh, the uh, 
you know, looking at uh, histone chips, um, histone methylation marks and, and DNA methylation marks. Um, so you have, again, we won't go into much detail, and honestly, I'm not an expert in this, but you have a de novo methylation, which is really sort of the addition of, of one of these metal groups. Uh, but one other uh, key feature of, these, uh, of uh, this type of methylation is that there's maintenance of this methylation. So if it's found on, on one strand, it gets added to the other strand. And this is one way uh, you really have sort of the traditional epigenetics, which is this memory from one cell to the next, where that mark sort of stays on as cells differentiate or, or, or replicate. Uh, so why study methylation? Uh, so it's really uh, the main mark that's, uh, that has really demonstrated mitotic inheritance uh, through this uh, you know, what I've just described, this, this maintenance of methylation where when you, observe, you have it on one strand, it actually gets added to the other strand as it gets replicated. Uh, and, and the reason why it's also very interesting is that it's really associated with a number of key uh, processes uh, in regulation, so genomic imprinting, uh, whether it's the paternal allele or the maternal allele that gets, uh, shuts down through methylation, uh, it's quite important in the context of transposable element silencing. So these elements are typically recognized in the genome as, as being, you know, where you want to repress them such that they don't make copies uh, in the genome. So again, methylation plays a big role in silencing uh, transposable elements. So there's a lot of, of uh, literature around that. Um, methylation in the context of stem cell differentiation because, again, of this uh, these marks actually gets passed on to, to uh, cells as they differentiate. Uh, so again, um, so embryonic development, stem cell differentiation, inflammation, uh, and also cancer. So cancer in particular, uh, so this is the, the mini uh, slide that I had in, in, the, in the beginning. And, and this, re this is really the type of thing that, that hopefully by the end of, of the morning session we'll be able to, to identify more or less. So so you have the normal, uh, normal state here, up here, where, where you see that uh, genes that are actually turned on are, tend to be associated with regions that are uh, less uh, compacted, so, so um, where the DNA is not as compacted and doesn't have methylation, while genes that are repressed uh, have these high levels of methylation, in particular in the promoter, uh, and, and tend to be in regions uh, where the DNA is more compact. Uh, in cancer, what you have is a disruption of, of that, that normal state, where in some cases you have really the sort of, uh, on, on both sides, you can have methylation that gets added uh, in, in, uh, on the promoter of gene that should have been uh, turned on, uh, so especially so tumor suppressor end up being repressed, uh, while oncogene in, in, in reverse uh, can, can really have uh, be activated because of the loss of, of DNA methylation. So you really have uh, both sides uh, that can happen. So this is really um, sort of reg uh, relative to just a, a, the regular expression uh, of gene. Uh, you have uh, other uh, factors or other implication of, of abnormal methylation in the genome. Um, so. So down here you have additional examples. I talked about the transposable element, for instance. Uh, so transposable ele element, again, in the normal state get uh, uh, shut down such that they're not able to, to make copies or they're not expressed and don't make copies in the genome. So in some case, loss of methylation there uh, in cancer can be a problem. Uh, some regions that, <clears throat> that open up uh, in cancer it's not just expression, you might actually have genomic stability uh, that's associated with that. So, so again, uh, well, so this is also on, on repetitive sequences in this case, but uh, bottom line is that, so, so being able to, to compare sort of the normal state where, uh, of methylation with, with the abnormal state that in some cases happens in cancer is, is one of the things that, uh, that we want to be able to do and why we're doing these assays. Um, okay, so now off to, uh, to the different uh, types of assays uh, that, um, that are available to actually study methylation. Um, so I'll, I'll explain bisulfite uh, treatment in a second, uh, but just so that you have a, this, this broad overview. So you have microarrays um, for, for detecting methylation. 
Um, so, so again, we'll, we'll go into that in more detail. Uh, and then you have various enrichment-based methods where you're really um, sort of enriching for DNA fragments that are associated with uh, regions that are methylated. Part of this includes things that are very similar to what you saw yesterday in Chipsy. So again, we'll get back to that. And then finally, uh, the whole genome bisulfite sequencing uh, approach. Uh, but so, but but in case you're not familiar, let's let's start again with sort of the the basic uh, tool that actually gets used uh, and the nice uh, molecular trick that actually gets used to do this type of profiling of methylation, which is really this bisulfite treatment. Um, so bisulfite treatment, so if you see, so you've got two alleles, so it's the same region of the genome, but this allele has a CG, which is methylated, uh, and you have the exact same allele, but that's unmethylated. Uh, so what bisulfite treatment does is actually, uh, well, it doesn't affect directly the, the methylated seeds. What it does is it converts all the cytosines into uracils, uh, but actually all the cytosines that are unmethylated. So any unmethylated cytosyl gets converted by the bisulfite treatment into uracil. Um, and then uh, while the C are, are sort of protected from, the methylated C, sorry, are sort of protected from that treatment. Uh, one thing that, that we'll go over um, uh, later is that you'll see is that one of the things that's a little makes bisulfite, uh, now, uh, bisulfite treated uh, DNA a bit tricky is that it's not symmetric. So what's happening on the reverse strand uh, needs to be taken care of sort of separately because so it's because of these uh, changes. But again, we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, but again, so the key the key thing to, to really remember is that in the bisulfite treatment, um, the, the the unmethylated uh, C's get converted uh, to to uracils, uh, and then uh, so, so, and one, once we map them back to the genome, as you'll see, we'll be able to distinguish the, the C's that were methylated from the C's that have now been converted uh, when we map them back to the genome, basically. But again, I'll, I'll sort of get back to, to that uh, later on. The key from the bisulfite treatment is, again, what's happening with the unmethylated C that get converted uh, into the genome. So, so now off to the, the technologies, uh, and I'm highlighting in red in each case what's sort of specific to that particular technology. A lot of the steps are actually quite common from, from one method to the ne next. So with the bisulfite-treated uh, microarrays, what happens is that, so you prepare the DNA, you do this conversion, and then you hybridize on a microarray, and the microarray has probes uh, that distinguish uh, specifically uh, the C's that, that will have been converted from the C's that won't. So you have really sort of at the location of various CPGs that could be methylated or unmethylated, you have probes, and then it's very similar to any standard microarray analysis. Uh, you're just looking at the differential signal between the two, uh, the, the, the two probes. So you have data normalization and analysis that's not unlike regular microarrays, the only difference here, again, is that you're doing this bisulfite treatment, uh, and then you hybridize. Uh, so here's, here's a sort of an example of a relatively old uh, methylation microarray. So this is uh, one of the early version with 27,000 probes. Uh, so this is an Illumina Infinimum arrays. Since then, they have arrays that are 450K, which is a quite common array. They have the... Uh, the uh, EPIC array, which is, you know, over 800,000 probes, so the density is, is increasing, but this, I think, illustrates the point still quite well. So the challenge with, uh, well, if you think about gene microarrays, there's only perhaps 20,000 or 30,000 genes, so you're able to actually cover, uh, you know, the, the, the genes quite well. With uh, methylation and with uh, is the, the challenge is that there's lots of, of C's that are potentially methylated in the genome. Uh, if you see in, in black, you have all the C's that are in this uh, CG dinucleotide conformation, and you see that there's really, at, at, well, at this level, which is probably a, 
a multi megabase region, you really have quite a lot of potentially methylated Cs. Uh, so you see that, uh, and then in red, you have the, the regions, with these uh, CPG rich regions, which tend to be associated with promoters. If you look at the genes down below, you'll see that. In many cases, uh, the promoters of genes are associated with regions that are dense with CPGs. Uh, so, you, and then on top, you see uh, where these these probes from the 27,000 27, uh, K array were, were designed, and you see that they're really quite sparse. So, even though it gives you a very accurate and, and pretty robust uh, results because microarray technologies are very mature, uh, it still gives you very uh, sparse data. Uh, of, uh, throughout the genome. Now that it's 800,000 uh, probes, of course, that the density is much, much higher, uh, but it still ends up being not definitely not a base pair resolution profile of what, uh, what, what the methylation looks like. One thing that, that saves the arrays and still makes this um, very useful is that, uh, is that typically methylation doesn't really vary that much you know, on the base pair level, or, or it, it's thought that it's usually regions that are high or low methylations that are important. But again, uh, that's an assumption with the arrays that the sparse coverage will give you all the information you need. So, so that's that's one of the challenge. Um, so, a quick note: so that yesterday there were some some questions on tools, and and that's always a, a challenge to figure out what uh, what tools to use to do the analysis. And again, we won't go over these tools in much detail because that's that's not what we'll cover here. But uh, but there's a lot of tools that I would say that, again, for the microarrays are quite mature, whether it's the Illumina Genome Studio package, which really comes uh, with with these uh, chips that are frequently used, uh, RNA beads. So there's a lot of, of pretty mature uh, packages to do the microarray um, uh, bisulfite microarray data analysis, but this is not uh, what we'll cover too much. Um, so moving on from now, uh, the microarray-based approaches to some of the enrichment-based uh, approaches. So, uh, so again, many of the steps are, are, are similar. Um, so here, um, there's no uh, bisulfite uh, treatment. The, the main difference after the, the sonification of DNA and the library preparation is really an enrichment with an antibody uh, that recognizes uh, this 5-methyl cytosine. Uh, so this is what uh, Misha was talking about uh, yesterday, uh, where uh, this is the equivalent in a way of, of chip-seq uh, on, the hist on, on, the, on the histone marks, but where you're actually uh, pulling down using an antibody uh, DNA uh, uh, that's actually methylated in this way. And then the downstream analysis are actually quite similar to, to what you saw uh, yesterday. Um, another uh, method that's uh, quite similar to that, uh, conceptually at least, is, uh, is methyl cap, which is another enrichment-based approach, uh, where the enrichment this time is not an antibody but uh, is really a methyl binding DNA, uh, domain protein. So again, you're just enriching um, DNA uh, that, are, that is methylated based on this, and then it'll be uh, a, you know, very similar to a, a CHIP-seq uh, analysis. Um, the last uh, enrichment-based approach that I'll, I'll, I'll present to you this morning uh, is uh, this uh, RRDS method. Uh, where the initial step is, is a digestion with uh, an MSPI, which is a restriction enzyme that basically cuts uh, CG uh, in the genome. So the way of enriching, uh, enriching for DNA such that you, because one of the challenges, and we'll get to that when we do whole genome sequencing, is that to cover the whole genome, uh, you end up having to sequence quite a bit. Uh, so here the advantage is that it, specifically cuts region uh, with uh, CGs, such that it enrich uh, your DNA fragments for uh, reads in CPG islands and in CG-rich region. So this is just a strategy to enrich which region of the genome you're looking at. Um, and then you follow with the bisulfite treatment, which we talked about. You do a vacation and you do high-throughput sequencing. That's just really a way of, of enriching. 
it's sort of associated with, with challenging biases a little bit in terms of what regions are covered. So that's one of the limitations, I guess, which we'll get back to. Uh, but just continuing on, on the example that I showed uh, before, where, um, you know, so the, the bottom of this slide is the same thing as I've shown you before. So again, there's tons of CGs in the genome. Uh, the arrays will only cover um, some of them. Um, so what you see here are this last uh, method that I talked about, the RRBS, uh, and you see the reads a bit like you would see, I guess, chip seek reads. So you see the reads uh, that, are, that have been bisulfite treated and their location. And so you see that they tend to indeed enrich, oops, you see that the, most of the reads are not sort of uniformly distributed across the genome. They tend to be uh, associated with CP, uh, CBG islands. Uh, so that's a way of sort of efficiently covering these regions with, with less sequencing in some ways. Um, so that's with the R RBS data. Uh, while uh, the MIDI SIP and the metal cap uh, again have this is now an enrichment base exactly like what you saw yesterday uh, where you have profiles um, that you know that are enriched basically for methylation uh, it's it, you know it's different in the sense that it's not this, this base pair resolution uh, but you definitely get a sense of which regions from this data uh, have high or low methylation, and so you can do, um, you know, it, well, analysis uh, very similar to, to what you did yesterday, but where we're looking at uh, DNA methylation. Um, so what are the, the, uh, the, again, this is another, so we also won't focus on this, but this is just to give you uh, some ideas of, of how to do the processing of this enrichment-based data. Uh, so depending on whether, so again, you're, you're going to get bots. So as opposed to the microarrays, which was really uh, software to do microarray data analysis and normalization, this is uh, in some case similar to what you've done with the ChIP-seq. Um, so where you're going to be using uh, mapping algorithms where you're getting reads. So you map them using Bowtie and BWA, for instance. Uh, but then you, you'll have uh, tools that are specific <coughs> To, to methylation data and looking for enrichment in these uh, in these data sets. Um, so before um, before moving on to the whole genome bisulfite sequencing, and then maybe I'll, I'll stop as well to, to let you guys ask some question. But uh, this is from a, a, an older review, but still gives an idea uh, of of um, some of the differences in coverage sort of more quantitatively than what we saw in the, uh, in the figure. Um, so especially in different regions of the genome, the coverage tends to be very, very different. Uh, so if, we, if you look at the two enrichment-based approaches, uh, you see that they're actually quite good. So, so the, the way to look at this, so you've got different regions of the genome, whether you're looking at CPG islands or you're looking at promoter regions, which again, uh, there's a good correlation between these two uh, regions, uh, or whether you're looking across the genome uh, completely, uh, and you ask, you know, from these enrichment base, what's the what's the typical coverage, the amount of reads you have to be able to call uh, these different <coughs> regions. So what you see is that these uh, enrichment based approaches are very good uh, in CPG islands and and in uh, promoters. Uh, this is also true at some level with, uh, with the RRBS. Um, well, but once you move to, to the whole genome, uh, you really obviously have uh, much less coverage. Uh, regions when you have just a few reads, you won't really be able to, 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 to call or to say much uh, in, these, uh, in these regions in terms of an enrichment of whether it's methylated or unmethylated. Uh, the arrays, and this again is is sort of an older version of the array uh, that you know didn't have as many pro. This has improved, but you're still left, you know, overall covering relatively well uh, the promoter regions and the CPG islands, but not necessarily knowing uh, what's what is happening in, in in the whole genome as you would expect. I mean, one can argue, and this is the same argument with uh, with variance and mutation, is that. You know, the important thing is to know uh, what's happening in, in genes and in promoters, because anyway, we don't know much how to interpret uh, 
um, what's happening in the rest of the genome, but obviously if we don't have tools to, to be able to look in those regions, we also won't be able to, um, uh, to be able to, to say much about them. Um, okay, so, so finally the, the, the technology and the approach that we'll spend most time uh, looking at is, is whole genome bisulfite sequencing. Uh, so this has the advantage of, of, of in many ways, being uh, simpler, uh, at least in terms of because you don't select any regions and it's really uh, only the bisulfite treatment uh, followed by sequencing. So you're not uh, selecting in any way what you're looking at, you're looking at the whole genome. The, the big limitation here is really the cost because, uh, again, you need to do uh, full genome sequencing which will cost you per sample um, you know, likely a few, a few thousand dollars. So that's, that's really the big uh, limitation here. Um, one sort of twist, and I guess maybe that should have been in the enrichment-based approaches as well, one, one strategy uh, to, to reduce the cost of whole genome bisulfite sequencing uh, is, is really sort of uh, mimics what you can do with whole genome sequencing with versus exome sequencing is you do the same step as whole genome sequencing except that you have a step where you capture uh, the DNA fragments of interest. So you can actually have probes uh, at the end like this, again, exactly with like exome sequencing where we, you would design probes across genes uh, and then capture DNA fragments that are associated with gene. Uh, so here, for you can do the same with methylation, except that you can design the probes not just on the genes and the promoters, but potentially on on uh, on various uh, regulatory regions that have been pre-identified using something else. So you can really decide basically where you look in the genome using these types of capture uh, bisulfite sequencing approaches. Um, okay, so. Um, so tools, and this is now uh, closer to some of the tools that we're going to be covering uh, in, 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 the, in the practical. Uh, so some of the tools uh, for processing whole genome bisulfite sequencing, and you'll see, well, so I've, I've listed them here um, in, in the next uh, few slides, once we actually go into the pipeline, I'll explain in, in more detail some of the differences because there's really, really different philosophy of how you process um, these bisulfite sequencing reads. Really, the, the challenge is that, as if you remember, uh, we've changed some of the DNA bases in the read such that the mapping step is going to be a bit of a mess because they no longer necessarily map to the reference uh, directly. Um, okay, so uh, last slide, and then and then uh, I'll. I'll open up for, for some questions because we'll have covered sort of all of the intro in terms of the different technology. This is the last slide on this where um, so <coughs> microarray versus enrichment based versus full genome bisulfite. So, uh, you know, at some, at some level all of them provide pretty accurate DNA methylation measurements. Uh, microarrays typically have lower costs and, and provide accurate measurements and definitely across a large number of CPGs that typically focus on, on the uh, important regions that, that, leads to, that we know about, uh, whether it's promoter and CPG islands. And again, with the arrays that cover uh, close to a million uh, features, uh, you really get a pretty, pretty dense uh, and robust uh, uh, methylation profile. Enrichment-based methods uh, have uh, relatively low resolution because all you're looking at is regions that are enriched or, or depleted for methylation, um, but, but again, still have uh, at least a, a low cost and can be applied and, and are not restricted uh, specifically to the places in the genome that you've, uh, for which you have probes. Um, the bisulfite-based methods provide, um, so absolute TNA measurements, and that's what we're going to see. So one of the neat thing, and I didn't discuss that yet, but with the the reads, uh, you really are going to get the quantitative measure of how many reads, uh, you know, correspond to a fragment that was methylated or unmethylated. Uh, so that's, uh, as you'll see, you know, really provides, and, and there's also additional application if there are variants, and, and again, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so that, that, those are some of the, of the challenges. I didn't mention, but that, you know, these enrichment-based methods do have biases that in some cases are, are 
challenging to control and to 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 uh, to remove. Uh, and finally, with with whole genome by self -like sequencing, um, you know the main main limitation is really the cost. But as the costs go down, uh, you know there's good chance that this will really become the, the method of choice for uh, this type of profiling, especially given that uh, again you're not restricting um, to to specific regions of the genome, so you're really doing a, an unbiased survey of what's happening. So. Uh, so I'll stop here for a minute, and I don't know if you guys have questions. Um, you, were, you were already mentioning it. I'm, I'm a little missing the big picture. So if you look at what we learned yesterday, where the histones are methylated and acetylated, yes. and here the DNA is methylated, is it completely independent mechanisms, or is it is it like you know working hand in hand? So it's I guess it's both. <laughs> Can I say that? So it's like so there's differences, and there's definitely some correlations as well. But these are independent mechanisms that uh, that really, in, in some case, you know, it's really the DNA methylation that is used to, for the repression. And so it's, uh, I mean, but that's these assays and these profiling is really to unravel these relationships uh, that, that we need to be able to do this type of profiling. But it's, there, there are independent uh, mechanisms. It's just that sometimes they do work hand in hand together. And you have sometimes similar results from both. That's yeah, saying. that's right. So, but again, sometimes uh, you know, sometimes you really have one mark that precedes the other, and then the other one that's being put to reinforce the same state. But oh, okay. um, yeah. Yes. So that's that's a that's a good point. So I talked to, the, when you say limitation, what do you mean? So the fact that. That's right. Yes. Right. So there's so so as I said, sort of we, we focus here on just one type of DNA methylation, which is the cyto uh, cytosyl uh, cytosyl methylation. There's other types of uh, of methylation. So one of the advantage of of whole genome bisulfite sequencing, for instance, is that it's not restricting to detecting that mark only on the on the CPGs, for instance. So you're able to detect other uh, uh, C-methylation outside of that context. But to detect other uh, types of methylation there, you really have to have additional or different treatment uh, that are not bisulfite or that combine. So there's different assays that actually allow you to isolate or to, to, uh, to really convert only certain types of methylation marks. So there's lots of parallels to, to what we're going to look at and what we're going to see here. But but definitely, in terms of the treatment, you need to make some adjustment and use other treatment that actually I allow you to isolate other types of methylation. Yes? And when you are mentioning that the GBS is very expensive, and is because you are looking at the whole genome, but why, can you pull your sample, or do you need, for example, to use three lane for one sample? So, yeah, so I mean, you can pull sample, but, but Typically, that's not going to help because you really need, because especially, you know, to be able to, to be sensitive to detect the methylation level, every base that you want to be able to estimate, you know, you need to have coverage on it. So it depends what resolution you want. So at the end, actually, I'll, 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 um, I'll talk about a paper that really does this type of analysis of what type of coverage do you want. So it depends whether you, you just want to be able to detect methylation sort of broadly in the region or if you really want to have base pair resolution. If you really want to have base pair resolution to know if that base is methylated, then you need lots of reads to cover it. And so then you're stuck having to do 30x, which you know you can't pool and mix samples so much. If you're happy with, uh, with having sort of a not as refined a resolution, and then and just you're looking for these large regions that are differentially methylated, then then you can go down to coverage of 5x or, or maybe, you know, and things like that. And then uh, then it makes sense to actually pull samples, uh, and, and that does reduce the cost quite a bit. Yeah? You mentioned a little bit that you can have any type of polymorphism if yes. you use these arrays. So I guess that these arrays choose, like, specific Cs, that are not polymorphic in humans. Yes. But if our question is actually if like you have polymorphism in the probability <coughs> that would impact the, the, oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you cannot 
Yes, so so we'll, we'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. So it's much better then, but it's also challenging to use sequence-based data because at least there you have the information um, on the reads directly on potentially these alternative alleles, and so you can do a lot more, but the bioinformatics ends up being quite challenging as well. But uh, but I'd say, yeah, it's definitely much more powerful if you're interested in, in variants on top of uh, and methylation combined, then, then the sequence-based assays are typically better. But again, for that, you do need this base pair resolution. So you would need either an enrichment-based approach such that you have sufficient coverage or go for really 30x whole genome bisulfite sequencing because if you have shallow read coverage, you won't be able to look at these um, shallow questions. Yes? Uh, I'm just going to build on uh, Marco's question before regarding DNA methylation versus system methylation. Yes. Uh, let's assume we have system methylation for one specific site or one specific gene, and then we have DNA methylation for the same site. Uh, if, if we want to see how much this, uh, this specific gene or this specific region is actually regulated by, by these methylations, so do they actually have some sort of aggregated um, effect or aggregated regulation effect on that gene or how do they interact? So I don't know, maybe Martin, you're better than me to answer that question. What's it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, we're getting into a little bit of biology and I think <laughs> the, the best answer to that question is it's context specific. They're not additive. So in some cases, the relationship between the histone mods and the methylation is anti-correlated. For example, polychrome. Um, another example would be K27 acetylation. Another example would be K4 trimethylation. And me mechanistically, that's well understood. So the enzymes that control the modifications are, are actually um, mutually uh, recruited uh, by one modification or the other. And in other cases, they, they actually reinforce one another. In, and this is, for example, at retroviral elements, where, for example, H3K9 trimethylation is present and DNA methylation. And if you lose one, and people have done these kinds of experiments in embryonic models or in early development, you still have repression of retroviral elements. So it's like a, it's a redundant mechanism ensuring those things are repressed. But they're not additive. I, I can't think of any cases where the two marks work together to, to be or, that are additive and in that sense if I'm understanding your question as well. Yeah, so there are a finite number of scenarios for how do they regulate like this one and this one, like uh, how they regulate the expression level for like, Yeah, like, well yeah, so I mean take take, take the examples of answers that we talked about yesterday. So they're marked by K27 acetylation. Transcription factor, pioneering transcription factors are recruited, which then recruit the, the enzymes, the TET family of enzymes, which then demethylate that region, and that allow other transcription factors to be recruited. So I, I don't think that they're working, I mean, they're, they're together making a code, for sure, but I don't think they're working together in the sense that I think you're, you're suggesting. No, I Mechanistically, I think, I mean, a lot is known about the mechanisms of their regulation. It's, yeah, at the end of the day, what, what, what I mean is the function is, the function can be, can be inferred from, from the DNA methylation, or the histone methylation. Yes. We, 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 we can infer which, which one is actually regulating the Yeah, although, I mean, recent, I mean, so the, this is still an active area of research. Right. So gain of CPG island methylation dogmatically has been associated with repression, and in the context of malignancy, it has been thought to be mediating repression of tumor suppressor genes. But recent evidence suggests that's not the case. In fact, we, we see heavy methylation of CPG ions, yet the gene remains transcribed. So I think we're still learning. We're still, I don't think these rules are fully worked out yet in all, in all scenarios. But I think it's fair to say that these are independent mechanisms that work, you know, but it's context dependent in different ways uh, to reinforce. But so, I mean, there's but there's even marks that we are still, you know, discovering. So we haven't, you know, we're far from understanding the full range of combination and how they actually act together. All right. So, um, so now off to the the actual uh, data analysis workflow for, as I said, uh, mainly the bisulfite sequencing data, uh, whether it's this enrichment-based bisulfite sequence. Uh, treated uh, sequencing data or the whole genome uh, by sulfide sequence data. Uh, so the main steps, and, and this um, you'll see is, you know, typical NGS workflow. Um, 
So there's the initial processing of the sequencing data, uh, some quality control and pre-processing, uh, the bisulfite sequence alignment, and that's where I mentioned already uh, there, you know, there's a few interesting twists. Um, and then uh, the quantification of DNA methylation itself. Um, then uh, the data visualization, some statistical analysis. Um, so we're, and, and that's also what we're going to be doing in the lab, some visual inspection of selected regions, uh, looking at global distribution of values. Again, that's, that's quite similar to some of the things that you did um, yesterday, except that it's going to be done now in the context of ventilation, um, clustering of samples based on similarity, uh, and then after that, some downstream analysis where you're looking at these uh, regions that are differentially methylated regions. Um, okay, but uh, first things first, so quality control and, and pre-processing. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, this was already highlighted yesterday, but uh, it's really important uh, before you start the analysis uh, to look at your raw data. Uh, so I say it's really important, and that's actually not what we'll do in the lab, but usually, you know, it's, it's really uh, highly recommended that you look at the properties as you've done yesterday with the ChIP-seq data uh, using uh, tools like PASQC. Um, you know, where all your sample sequence using the same protocol and instruments. Uh, once you, you know, this is going to be especially important once you start combining uh, multiple data sets. And so this is, you know, these, these are standard things to, to, to watch for. Are there any technical issues that are affecting some of the sample? Uh, this will be important once you start comparing samples or different conditions, uh, obviously. Um, so, uh, so you can also run uh, tools like FASTQC uh, that, that you saw yesterday. And actually, if we have enough time, uh, maybe that's something that, uh, that we'll be able to do at the end of the, or I mean, we should be doing it at the beginning, but I wanted to make sure we'd have enough time to cover other things that you hadn't seen. But if we have extra time, uh, that's one of the things that we could, we could add as well in, in the practical. <coughs> Um, so running PASQC on, uh, on, on your data sets initially, um, you know, you'll see that the, the profile and the base composition uh, with, with uh, different, you know, different, these assays uh, are, are slightly different. Um, so, uh, you know, that's in part because, of course, of this, uh, the conversion uh, that took place with the bisulfite sequencing in the context of whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So that's why the profiles are different uh, in terms of, so this shows, um, you know, the, the percentage of the T, C's, A, and, and C's. Uh, so again, the C's have been uh, uh, converted, so you really have a different profile than with regular whole genome sequence uh, data. In the context of RBS, uh, the profile also look uh, quite different because of the properties of the initial enrichment and the cutting. But but again, the key, you know, you'll have to look at a few of these to, to see uh, what it looks like. The key is really to also make sure that all of your sample really have a similar profile. So that's, you know, one, one important thing to look at uh, even before doing the processing itself. Um, so depending on, so very similar to, to what you saw yesterday, uh, you know, you've got quality scores associated with the read, and so depending on on quality, you might uh, want to do uh, some, some trimming of the reads, some simple trimming. Uh, again, so I'm not uh, going into as much detail here because uh, you spent quite a bit of time uh, on this uh, yesterday, and there's really uh, quite a lot of, of similarities here. Um, so, so you can trim based on, yeah, so simple trimming, dynamic trimble, which is window-based, uh, or, or um, you know, trimming based on uh, so mock trimming. Um, so, uh, so again, hopefully you don't have a distribution that looks like what you see here on the left. Uh, but even if you do, you do have ability to uh, to clean up and, and sort of focus on uh, reads that are of, of uh, a better quality. But overall, you know, hopefully this uh, as the instruments have been uh, getting better. Has been is, is less of an, an issue. Um, the other uh, the other important thing, and, and I'm sorry I missed uh, some of yesterday, so I don't know how much 
uh, you went over this, but but this is a very um, important point, especially for uh, for libraries that have um, PCR amplification, uh, especially because here we're going to be interested in uh, actual. Um, we're going to be interested in, in the number of reads that have, uh, you know, a, a methylated C uh, versus reads that don't. So the quantification of reads is going to be very important. Uh, so if you have, uh, you know, reads that are really uh, PCR amplified, uh, this will really uh, sort of throw off your estimates of the actual number of, of reads that have a particular uh, methylation state, right? So um, when you have a library that's of low complexity, where you have many reads that basically have been amplified, uh, for, for you know accurate quantification of these methylation, it's important that you actually deduplicate uh, and remove reads that are identical uh, and really represent uh, the same read in, from the original uh, library. So I, in an ideal case. Uh, you have a complex and diverse library that doesn't have uh, so many of these reads uh, that are identical. Uh, but so, I mean, you have it, so uh, I mean, I guess I didn't explain. So here you have this, this uh, complex uh, library, but once, uh, you know, you have just this, you know, one read uh, that's been duplicated and amplified uh, that obviously all has the exact same uh, methylation status. Uh, it's going to make you know. It's going to change and offset your your estimates of methylation. You'll say this is methylated at seventy one percent, while actually you only had one read that was unmethylated and one read that was methylated. So the actual percentage in this case, based on the information that you receive, uh, is really uh, is is fifty percent. So that uh, deduplication and removing duplicates and and monitoring the rate of duplicates. Uh, is quite important in the context of uh, these analysis because, again, it'll, it'll offset your um, your rates. Um, so, so things to look at in, in these initial uh, stage steps is really um, so looking at the read quality uh, using things like PASQC, presence of adapter sequences. Uh, we've talked uh, quite a bit about duplication rate. Um, another thing that uh, I guess I didn't have uh, slides on, but that's also critical, is really the conversion rate. Uh, so in, in the bisulfite treatment, if you uh, don't treat sufficiently, you'll have a low conversion rate uh, of your library. And that's also going to uh, offset your estimate of, of methylation. Uh, so typically, in, as part of the experiment, you really have additional controls. Uh, of, of sequences that are um, fully methylated uh, or, or unmethylated and that allow you to, to estimate the conversion rate. So you need to have uh, a high conversion rate uh, in your experiment to ensure that, uh, uh, that your estimates of methylations are, are, are correct. But that usually is really done in the initial uh, uh, preparation stage of the library, but but it's, it's good to, to also look at these estimates of, of uh, conversion rate uh, from the analysis. So this is all part, really, of the, the initial quality control and, and pre-processing. Um, so now, now we're going to get to the fun part, which is really uh, the bisulfite uh, sequence alignment. And the fun, fun part is once we get to the variance, but that's, uh, that's after. You'll see that it's already uh, fun uh, when we talk about uh, the alignment. Uh, of these reads. Um, so, so this is a similar slide uh, to, the, uh, to what I showed you when I explained the bisulfite treatment in the beginning. Um, somehow, uh, usually if I haven't had my coffee, I get confused uh, when I start thinking about this, uh, this alignment. Um, so, so again, so let, take it step by step, right? So you really have uh, so methylated Cs and unmethylated Cs in the genome. Uh, one thing, again, that, that you'll will have to be careful here is that the two-strand, this process is not uh, symmetric. Uh, the conversion is not, the conversion that happens with the bisulfite treatment is different uh, on the two strands. So you really, so denaturation, the two strands are split. The bisulfite treatment, uh, as we've talked about, uh, converts 
So the methylated C's are protected, but uh, the unmethylated C's get converted to uracil. Uh, again, this is slightly different what's happening on the two strands in this case, because again, on the two strands you have different, uh, different C's that will get converted. So that's why you have to, to really think about what's happening on the two strands at the same time. Um, and then uh, through the PCR amplification process, um, these uh, uracil get converted to, to back to T. Um, so this is really where, uh, you know, this, this new sequence, which is whether it's U or T, uh, once you map it back on the reference genome, um, you know, this, this sequence will no longer, uh, well, assuming that the reference is a C at that location, so, so it, the, the read will no longer map uh, at that location. The methylated C will be fine, but those unmethylated C basically will become a uh, mismatch. Uh, in the amplification process, you also get uh, uh, the, the, the complementary strands. So again, you need to, to keep track of this because it's not the same thing that's happening uh, with both strands. So the, the second strand on the right, again, we sort of follow. Uh, methylated C were protected. Uh, and then the, the unmethylated C convert to uracil following PCR amplification become T. And, and all of these T's are not part of the genome. So once we map them, uh, we'll, they'll, they'll be viewed as, as variants, basically. But, but again, we'll need to treat that uh, carefully. Excuse me. Yeah? But um, the methylated cytosine, once it's um, converted by sulfide, the, the, cytos the methylated cytosine just remains a cytosine, right? So the methylation status is lost. It's not carried over. That's right, but the fact that it, so it's again assuming that the conversion rate is very high, every C that you observe later on, you can assume that it was uh, it was methylated. That's right. But the methyl group is it? Yeah, the methyl group. It's not replicated in PCR. Right. Um, but again, every C that we'll see, <laughs> every C that we'll see in these uh, PCR read were methylated initially, and every mismatch of a T on a C will correspond to an unmethylated, uh, unmethylated C. Uh, so in terms of so the, the, the data processing, what, so what's the approach that can be used now, given that we have these reads, you know, that have these artificial, uh, so lots of artificial T's where you would have uh, C's, uh, and A's where you would have G's. So, so there's really uh, three main approaches uh, that can be used uh, bioinformatically to, to deal with these reads and, and do this alignment or, or actually, so two of these approaches are uh, alignment based and the third one, which we, we, you know, we'll talk a little bit about is this reference free processing. Uh, but the two main approaches are really wildcard alignment and tree letter alignment. Um, so wildcard aligners, so the trick that's used for wildcard with these alignment tools is really to, you know, replace, so to avoid these mismatches, you actually replace all the C's uh, in the genomic DNA sequence by a wild character Y. So you basically have a wild card uh, associated with all the C's, which is going to match both the C's and the T uh, in the read sequences. Um, so uh, you can also potentially modify the, the alignment scoring matrix such that, so depending again on the, the mapping tool that you use, either you can convert the genomic sequence to have these wild cards, or you can modify the alignment scoring matrix um, to, uh, to really don't count these as real mismatches, basically. So there's a number of tools, including this, uh, VSMAP and, and PASH, that use this, this basic idea of having a wild card. So, so all C's basically uh, will be viewed as, as wild card, and you're going to allow uh, and not count basically mismatch uh, from T's onto these. So that's, that's approach number one. Uh, the, main, the, the other approach is, is this three base aligner. Uh, and again, that's, I mean, both of these things uh, usually, but I have a figure and then we'll see some examples. So the second approach is really three base aligner. Um, so, so you convert uh, a bit like you do with the, the bisulfite treatment itself. 
uh, you convert all the C's into T's in the reads uh, for both the strands for both strands of the genomic DNA. Uh, so oh, sorry. So, so you convert uh, all the C's into T's in the reads and in the genomic DNA, doing that on both strands. So this is a strategy where <clears throat> you really sort of instead of forget about the four letter uh, alphabet, you sort of uh, implicitly convert everything into a three base uh, alphabet, uh, and after that uh, we'll extract back uh, for the mapping step, and after that we'll, we'll extract back what was really happening. <clears throat> so again, uh, we'll, sh we'll show an example, because for sure, I mean, you hear those two things, and in my mind, the first, first few times I heard this, it's really not clear, you know, what, what really is the impact or how different uh, these two approaches actually work and what's, what, how, how things change from doing these two approaches. So approach number one, you have this wild card uh, where you don't count mismatch at that location. And approach number two is that you convert everything into this three base uh, alphabet. Uh, and the tool, uh, main tool that, that uses this approach is Bismarck, and that's the tool that we're actually going to be uh, running. So, <clears throat> so how, how does that work? Uh, and what's the impact of these two general strategy? And again, I mean, uh, if, if you're a bit lost here, that's, that's okay, I think, because uh, I think initially, um, you know, this is not, not trivial. Uh, you know, what's the impact of using one approach versus the other? So let's, let's try to go through this. So, so suppose that you have, um, you have this DNA, so you, you get some CPGs. Uh, this one is 100% methylated. This one is 50% methylated, 50%, 0%, right? So, so now we extract from this uh, these tiny, uh, tiny reads that are uh, bisulfite. Uh, sequence reads, but they're just very small reads. Um, so, in, in the wildcard strategy, uh, again, the C's in, in this context are converted into this wildcard, uh, such that whether it's a C or a T uh, in your read, if your read has a C or a T, like in this case, uh, both of these will map equally well to the wild card. Um, the problem, though, is that uh, once you allow that, um, you know, you end up with cases like, like this read, which, um, you know, so, so again, here, 100%, meaning both reads uh, were protected, such that you still have a C, uh, right? Um, so both reads are methylated, so you have a protected C, such that in the reads, the bisulfite-treated reads, you have a C. So th that's this scenario. Here, you've got 50% methylation, such that you have some reads that have a C, some reads that have a T. In both cases, these map equally well to that location because it's a wild card. Here, uh, so this is where it gets interesting and a bit tricky. Um, here, you see that the C, uh, this, um, the, so the methylated C, which remains a C, actually maps back to this location. But this, the unmethylated one, actually some, now, because of this wild card, does map here, but it also maps somewhere else in that short sequence. Such so that actually this would be a multi-map read, and typically you might actually not count that read. Um, so this is a bit sneaky because at that same location, uh, the, the methylated C maps, and the unmethylated C ends up not mapping because it becomes ambiguous. So that's also going to create some challenges in the analysis because it's basically not symmetric, the mapping of the, the two. So that's, that's, well, I'll get to that, but that's the tricky part with the wild card is that, it, you know, it does work, but it has, in some case, this limitation where it's not necessarily behaving the same for both reads, both type of methylated or unmethylated reads. Yeah? Could you increase the size of that's, that would help, but it's still this does still happen. So in some regions that are not very complex, you still have. So this is a cartoon example. That's you know, obviously if you have and we do have longer reads, this is going to be less frequent. But in regions that have that are low complexity and that have high methylation, or you know, you'll you're going to have 
this effect happening in some regions of the genome, and it's still going to lead to some, some funny things. So that's, that's one of the challenge with these approaches. Um, so, so I explain uh, the, the wild card alignment strategy. The three-letter alignment strategy uh, is, you know, is what we're going to be using. So this one, but has other limitations. This one, you see that uh, everything in the genome and in the reads has now been, there's no more C. So we've converted all of this to a three-letter alphabet uh, genome. And here you've got another problem, which is now that that it's very conservative because you actually end up, you've reduced the complexity of the genome quite a bit. So suddenly many reads become ambiguous in terms of where they map. Uh, the advantage though here is that this is the same for both the methylated and unmethylated reads. So at least you don't suffer from a bias in terms of, you know, just, just one type of read, which would offset your, uh, your methylation estimates. The problem, though, here is that you end up, and again, this is a cartoon example. Obviously, if you have longer reads, this is less of an issue, but it still illustrates the problem. You end up with, you know, more ambiguity, so more regions, and that's what you see at the bottom. There are more regions where, you know, there's not enough, <coughs> uh, um, so you're not sure whether the reads are mapping here. There's, because it's only three-letter alphabet, they can map in many places. So there's more regions that end up not being covered because of that ambiguity. Um, so hopefully, so those are the two main types of aligners, and hopefully that makes a bit more sense, or it makes a bit of sense in terms of what it is. Uh, so as I was saying, so um, the tree-letter the tree alignments have lower coverage, especially in these highly methylated regions. So highly methylated regions have lots of Cs. And so these end up in these regions end up being very low complexity, uh, given that we've changed, uh, uh, you know, because of the three-letter alphabet. So you end up sort of decreasing coverage a little bit in these regions of, of uh, low complexity. Again, the longer the reads, the less this is an issue. But you know, it's still an issue in some regions of the genome. Uh, wildcat aligners uh, typically have higher coverage overall, so they use they. they they keep more of the reads, um, uh, but but they do have uh, this this bias uh, in some case uh, that was illustrated in the previous uh, previous slides. So these problems, if you look at normal regions of the genomes, are actually not the big deal, such that both approaches end up being quite quite comparable. But if you look in, in repetitive regions. Um, you know that's that's a bit more of a challenge and in some of the application. Uh, you know, those are the regions that are of interest because looking at, at uh, repression of these regions is what you're looking at. So again, so it's it's not it's not trivial, but it's there's there's really no no perfect way of, of solving this except with longer reads potentially. Um, so the the tool that we're going to be running in the lab is is Bismarck, which uh, is one of these um, tree base uh, aligner. So one thing, and, and we'll have to do that as well uh, in, in the practical, is that so you need to convert the reads uh, to convert, uh, you know, on the, on the plus friend, the C's, the T's, and the G to A's on the reverse friend, and do the same in the reference genome. Uh, and then what the tool does is really sort of uh, collect uh, the result of these four alignments uh, simultaneously to decide... Uh, really whether this is a usable read and, and then ultimately what is the methylation state at that location. So, um, you know, so the, the, the Bismarck tool really, I guess, takes that complexity out of your hand. <laughs> so it does all of that work of actually converting the reads and mapping them. But I think sort of having an understanding of what's happening uh, under the hood is, is useful. But there's really... Some, some real limitation here because we're basically working with sort of modified reads. They no longer just map to the reference genome, so you need to, to, to take that into account. Um, so the last uh, sort of little, little uh, thing I wanted to touch on on these um, ways of aligning or analyzing uh, the whole genome by sulfide sequence reads is sort of a uh, a, a new and, and, and I guess, a promising approach, but that's still under development, 
And this is, uh, there was a question yesterday about reference-free or what happens if you don't have the genome of reference. So, I mean, so, so the idea, is there a way, because these reads don't typically map directly on the genome, uh, because of this conversion, could you actually forget about the reference genome uh, and, and, and work off directly uh, the reads themselves? Um, so there's a parallel, again, to what actually gets done with, with variant detection. Uh, so variant detection, uh, typically, again, this, is, I think, is a... I mean, you guys are doing the advanced uh, bioinformatics.ca course. Uh, exome calling is much easier than that because you just map the reads on the genome and you look for mismatch, right? So this is, actually, this is a screenshot of IGV, which is exactly what we're going to be using, but with methylation data. But this is exome variant calling, where you have a tumor and you have a normal sample. So these are the two sections. Uh, in, in gray, you have all the reads. Uh, you map the reads onto the genome. Again, in the context of, of exome sequence or genome sequencing, it's much easier. Um, because, you, you know, you don't need to do anything special. And then what this shows, it highlights the position that are mismatch on the reference. Um, and mismatch are exactly uh, correspond to these variants. In this case, uh, when you have, you know, lots of evidence that there's an A here, there's a lot, you know, so there's, a, there's a mismatch. Um, so in the same way, so there's also an approach for exome that basically skips the alignment step, uh, where all you do is actually compare basically reads. So you can have, you have reads that are tumor reads, and you have reads that are normal, you know, from your normal sample. Uh, and without doing this alignment step, you just basically compare, not the KMERS, but something similar to that. So you organize all the reads into these uh, sequence trees, and then you compare and you look for for bunches of reads that are basically different uh, in, in the two samples. So again, this is not really what we're going to cover, but I just wanted to give you uh, some idea of that there's alternative ways of dealing with this. So, so yeah? Sorry, how do you know what's the biological meaning of this if you can't pinpoint it to a specific gene or transcription? Well, so you could, that's right. So you could still, well, you know, so, so the idea is that you could basically from this uh, identify, you could still, after that, map all of these reads together to identify where that difference comes from, for instance. But you don't need to map them individually. Right to the genome, and then so you still need to know where it comes from for it to be interesting. But you could identify first the differences. Uh, so, for instance, well, so here this is relative to a variant. So you're detecting, you know, a whole bunch of reads that have two versions, basically one with a variant, one without. And then you would do that step of knowing where it goes in the genome as a secondary step. But you you would also, in a way, map it probably to the genome to know what it's doing. Yeah. And you probably create contents, so your reads are longer, so you know exactly where. It that's is. right. That's right. So because if you're not doing it read by read, maybe with multiple reads. Uh, so one challenge, for instance, if you're trying to detect, I mean, this was also for indels, for instance, which is the same type of problem where mapping the individual reads on the genome is difficult. So same with methylation or indels. So. The individual reads are difficult, but once you've pulled all of them together, you can build sort of larger context of what's really happening there, and then you can map that on the genome in a way. Um, so this is all on the variant detection side. It's just that there are tools that are now starting to come up that are trying to do that with, with methylation as well. And that might be a way, you know, we talked about the fact that there is ambiguity in some regions of the genome, right, where if it's, um, so again, this, this is getting a bit technical, but most of the genome is well covered with the alignment-based method for bisulfite sequencing, but there might be some regions where the alignment base is not working. And so using these types of reference-free approaches where you're just trying to group together reads um, that have interesting profile and then map them, you might be able to salvage something. But again, this is definitely not uh, standard uh, approaches right now, but just an alternative. Um, okay, so um, getting gradually into the, the fun side of things, which is the actual quantification. So again, I said, so the alignment, uh, 
uh, was one of the steps that really is quite particular for bisulfite sequencing compared to the chip seek or variant calling, which you know you, you you have your reads match the reference, so you're just mapping them to the reference. Uh, because of the bisulfite treatment here, the alignment the alignment was a bit weird. So what after that we want to quantify the methylation based on the alignment. Um, so I mean we've we've been already sort of circling around this. Um, so so the the, the basic uh, idea of course. Uh, and we, we've talked about this, but especially after you've removed duplicates, um, you know, you, what, the objective is to take uh, all your reads. Uh, you'll have, um, again, even after the alignment, the alignment gives you the location, but you don't lose, of course, the information of whether it was a T or a C in your sequence. Uh, but then you have, you're able to actually just count uh, how many you had, how many C's you had, how many T's you have, uh, and that does give you uh, a rate of methylation uh, from zero to 100 percent. So again, uh, as part of, of the Bismarck pipeline, for instance, you can extract that as well after uh, post the alignment. So that's uh, what you know. That's the key thing that we're going to be doing in the lab as well. So where it gets really exciting, confusing, interesting slightly almost impossible is is when you take into account the impact of SNPs. Um, so so again this is not uh, what we're going to be doing in the lab uh, per se but but I think it's important to, to keep that in mind um, and and also it's, a, it's it's one of the interesting application as we were saying of the sequencing based assay versus the arrays is that you can pull this information out so, so so far, every time I was talking about you have the reference genome and you've got the C's that might be T's and you're converting the sequences and, and all of that. I mean, arguably, I thought I, you know, it was complicated enough unless I explained it so well that it's all very clear to you guys. At least it's in the morning. It's not the late afternoon. But anyway, but all of that sort of assumed that the reference was what you actually had, right, in, in your genome. But there's lots of sites, as you know, that are <coughs> polymorphic. Uh, and, and also, um, you know, that our, the genome is, is diploid, so you actually might have two different alleles at some of these positions. So, so the, the story that I've been saying so far is complicated by the fact that you also have SNP at the same time uh, that, are, that are happening. So let's, let's try to walk through um, this figure a little bit, and again, this... Um, this this can be all you know a bit of fun, um, so so you have the reference genome right up here, uh, which again has you know this is C's and, and, and T's in this case, um, but but you might have some SNPs uh, in the sample that you're actually trying to that you're 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 measuring, so in this case uh, you have a C uh, to T SNP, so this uh, C is is a T. Uh, and and this um, this C uh, this T sorry uh, here is a is a C in the genome that you're looking at. Uh, so again, we we're not observing unless well. So in some case, you'll you'll have a separate genotyping assay that will tell you these these location. But in many cases, and in any case, uh, you know it's it's interesting to think about what's happening to the reads given this context and when you're mapping them on the reference genome. So, um, so here um, the C uh, gets converted uh, through the bisulfite treatment to a T. Um, so was that uh, a methylated C or an unmethylated C? If the C becomes a T, unmethylated, correct, right? So here, um, you know, the T, well, so the T here is, this is an actual T, right? But relative to the reference, uh, we're going to also think, so if you compare these T's and you look, it's a, it should be a C in the reference, you're going to think it's a methylated, this is also an unmethylated C. So you're going to make a mistake here, thinking that it's an unmethylated C. If you just 
you know, you don't think into account the fact that there are SNPs. Uh, here, uh, this C, this T, this is actually a C, uh, you know, which is in this case, um, you know, so in this genome, it's actually also an unmethylated C in, in reality. But what you're going to observe is a T. So, so again, you know, I guess a little bit. So all of these Ts are very different Ts, basically, that you're observing. Yes. So to solve that, could you use the um, reference-free method and also having, for example, uh, for every sample, you have one that you sequence that is bisulfan converted and one that is unconverted, so that you can like, see before and after conversion without comparing to other things, you know, that could be sort of something like that. So you could do that, but that would be quite expensive. If you were to do that, you might as well do a genotyping array, potentially, and then know these locations already, right, or, or sequencing, or which is even cheaper. So you could know these locations using some other method, and then sort of annotate these as SNPs sort of separately. And then. But there's actually a, a neat, or the reference-free approach, potentially, would be another advantage. But, but there's a, a neat trick, actually, that can be used here uh, directly just using this data, which is the second strand. So what actually saves this or allows us to recover some of that information is the fact that on the reverse strand, things are happening differently uh, because of that methylation. So, um, so if you see, oops. So, so if you follow what's actually is happening on the reverse strand, um, these conversions of and, and when you actually had a SNP, we'll, we'll, you'll see that there's a mismatch. So if we go back to the regular case, um, you know, on the reverse strand, you actually, for the regular unmethylated C, on the reverse strand, you, you expect to have a G, which will have remained as a G. So, so this is what you should be looking for. Um, here, um, Again, uh, this is not what you see. Um, what you see here uh, with this, even though on the on the on the C strand you observe the T, mm -hmm. but you see that you know you have a mismatch. So there's a way by combining the information on both strands to actually recover the SNP versus the actually unmethylated and unmethylated C. But again, this. <laughs> Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the, the programmer who coded the, you know, how to extract that information because it's, it's really, there's lots of cases and you need to extract. And you also need to, to you know, to, to be able to then do this accurately, you need sufficient reads on both strands to be able to do this accurately. If you don't have sufficient reads on both strands, you'll, you'll be blind to, to this or you won't be able to very accurately make these, these calls. I mean, Think about the fact that there's also errors in the mix of this. It's not always perfect, so you also have sometimes. See, so it's it's really, I mean, it's really challenging to do variant calling. To do variant calling combined with this is is really quite quite challenging. One thing that yeah. How is this information preserved in the PCR? The information that's so you have essentially it's a mismatch, right? Yes. See, and you're getting the mismatch to tell you which is a which is a snip and which is not. Yes. That's right. So you don't have information. So that's why in so you don't have information on the strand anymore, but you do have the two types. So you're looking at a, a particular location to make sure that you have two types of reads. And then so you but you don't know originally which one came from which strand, which is why you have to do everything in parallel, assuming that you don't know that information. Um, so, uh, one more thing that I, you know, that I, I'll say on this is that typically the approach, the, unless that's what you're interested in, typically the approach is actually to take the common SNP and that. Oh, thank you. Okay, oh, thank you. Blind spot for me. So uh, yeah. So I, the last thing I was going to say on this is that what typically, unless you're interested in, in extracting this information, a safe thing to do is just to mask these regions that are common to have SNPs. To just get rid of that, because again, if you don't have sufficient coverage, you won't necessarily be able to know. There's also the fact that there's again two chromosomes, and so you have potentially two haplotypes. You know, two. Or, so it's pretty tricky. Yes. 
having that many challenges, is it difficult to do it on a complex tissue, for example? Is it possible to do that on a complex tissue? Or to do the variant calling or to do the methylation? Yeah, so, so, so the, the simple way around this is to just ignore the, the location of common SNPs because those regions are indeed problematic in terms of, of the output. So you can just mask those regions of common SNP. And then anyway, if the region is methylated, removing one of these bases will you know, hopefully not affect your, your analysis. But since, since the methylation pattern is not the same, all the cell types Complex tissue, we'll have issues. Oh, that's right. Well, okay, so that's a sort of a, a, a separate and also important point is that if you have a complex tissue, but this, I mean, that, that applies whether it's a variant site or not. Definitely, I mean, the fact that you, if you're looking at a complex tissue, the estimate of, of methylation might be confounded by that mixed tissue for sure. So, so are you better to separate your cells? If you can do that, that's good. There's also uh, tools that actually, uh, because typically separate tissues have very distinct metal, sort of methylation profile, there are ways to sort of extract the, the, the tissue composition actually by, by looking at, at different population of reads. So there's advanced tools that are trying to do that as well. But, uh, but yeah, usually what you're getting is an aggregate of the methylation. So if you have a mixed tissue, that's going to be something. Okay. This back-end, are there aligners like the problem So so again, so there are tools, um, so I have that on the next slide. There are tools that that really um, go in and, and extract the, the you know the information of both the variants and the methylation status on these variants. Uh, Typically, otherwise, um, again, you can input uh, common variants and sort of mask these regions before you do your DMR analysis, for instance, or something like that. Typically, the output is going to be a straight output of the methylation status at these various locations. It's just that the levels maybe will vary more at the location of these SNPs, but you have to do that sort of as a post-processing step of how you use the values there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, okay, so we're coming towards the end, and this was, I promised, sort of the, the most challenging part and maybe scariest part. Uh, again, there's there's ways around it, and there's information that can be extracted, but it's, you know, if if you thought Bismarck was a challenge, this is this is even more so when you're trying to extract the information on both strands in that way to detect potential SNPs and, and you know, allelic effects. Uh, so again, there are some uh, tools that systematically pull out that information and use the trick that I talked about um, of using both strands. Uh, and so there's some, uh, you know, and benchmarking on the accuracy. But again, for this to work, you need higher coverage. So this is what uh, this is showing in it to this, that you need uh, higher coverage to be able to really uh, extract that information uh, efficiently. Um, okay, but uh, unless there's other questions, uh, so I'll, I'll move on now to uh, to the next uh, parts, um, and and maybe we'll we'll finish a bit uh, earlier for the coffee break so that we have more time for the lab. Um, so this is now so we've we've done uh, you know as best as we could the alignment step quantification of the DNA methylation. So now we can uh, really move into the data visualization and, and some of the statistical analysis. Um, so, well, okay, so I sort of lied. This is another part that I find a bit confusing and, and challenging, is the way these reads actually get displayed. Uh, so so in, in the browser that we're going to use, the IGV browser, uh, it's quite nice because uh, it has specific function to display uh, bisulfite treated reads. Um, again, part of this is because, uh, well, in, in the practical, I think we'll, we'll see that. But again, if you just 
the rees have been mapped using this mark, using the neat trick. But, um, but if you look at the raw reads on the reference, you'll see mismatch everywhere. So if you didn't know that this was bisulfite tree, then you'd say, you know, what are these reads? So there's actually a function in IGV that actually allow to, to basically display the reads knowing that, uh, that these are bisulfite treated reads and knowing to sort of represent, um, you know, on the forward strand, if you have a C, well, that corresponds to a non-converted cytosine, uh, you know, while, um, so again, so it, it uses the information, the underlying information about the bisulfite treatment to display reads in a way that, that makes sense. So you'll, we'll go through that in, in the, in the, in, in the lab. Uh, so, so here, uh, again, it's sort of a typical view of IGV, uh, which is what we'll do. So, but we won't have normal tumor. We'll have actually two, uh, two replicates of, the, of, of the stem cell data set. Uh, but what we have here, we're looking at a particular region of the genome. Uh, here you have a profile that's, that's uh, not the methylation profile. What we'll have is a bit different. Uh, but, but down here is really what, uh, what we'll have, which are the reads. Um, uh, and then, you know, sort of, um, instead of showing mismatch of the reads to the relative genome, what this is purposely, purposely showing are methylated and unmethylated uh, Cs. Uh, so what you see are the this uh, unmethylated promoter uh, or methylated. I can, do I have it upside down? So red are so this is um, I guess unmethylated and methylated or or vice versa. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll go through it and see which one is which. Um, uh, and this is, this is really, uh, I guess, an example of what Martin says is no longer true in terms of what happens in, in, in tumors, uh, potentially. But this is an example of a promoter that really has uh, sort of uh, clearly a differentially uh, methylated state between the normal and the tumor. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll generate uh, these, these tracks and sort of navigate uh, in the browser to, to look for this as well. Um, so, so another thing beyond sort of looking at the, the overall uh, data uh, in the browser like this, uh, another important thing, uh, which you know, we, we won't do much in the, in the lab, but that's also useful, is to, a bit like you did with Misha yesterday, is really sort of visualize the global distribution of, of parameters uh, that you have. Uh, and, and you can do additional analysis like, like clustering, but some of the basic um, steps, I guess we will look at this a little bit in the context of looking at the output files of this mark, uh, but you can generate graph and look, of course, at the, uh, at the rate of methylation values, so across the various CPGs, um, you know, what the, uh, you know, how many of the CPGs are highly methylated or unmethylated, uh, What's the actual coverage? So the coverage across the CPGs to give a sense of the robustness of the estimates uh, of the methylation status. So, so again, getting these general statistics uh, tells us whether uh, the, the estimates and the experiment work uh, and so on. Uh, so, so there are a number of, of packages and tools uh, that, that really allow you to do a lot of this post-processing. Uh, Metal Kit uh, is, is one such example where you can really uh, you know, do these uh, pairwise comparison if you have multiple samples. This is now done across uh, different cell type. So really looking at, um, again, the, the methylation patterns and differences in methylation patterns. Um, so so uh, a key thing uh, is also to, you know, again, to ensure that, that your experiment work, uh, to look at, uh, so if you have now this, this array of, of methylation values across all your CPGs, um, you know, what, uh, you know, what are the similarity? Can you, so you can do a lot of, uh, of sort of, uh, comparative analysis between your sample, 
whether it's clustering or PCA. This is really, again, across all of the CPG uh, measurements. So we'll, we'll, have, um, um, we'll have the output uh, from, from the pipeline uh, where we would be able to look at these uh, types of things. Um, so, uh, so finally, and again, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll end early a little bit the session so that we have more time for the lab. Um, so there are some, so all of this so far was really done at the level of individual uh, CPGs. Uh, and, and typically, uh, a lot of the analysis on methylation are not done on the individual CPGs, are more done on differentially, are trying to look for regions that are differentially methylated. Um, so here's a, here's a slide that sort of uh, shows this a little bit. So, so you, can, you can look for, so again, the, the, the data that we've generated at this point uh, from the whole genome pi-sulfite sequence data is really, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll extract, for after the alignment, we'll extract these methylation profiles that basically tell us uh, for, for every sample the rate of methylation at each of these CPGs, so it's really base pair resolution. Uh, so you'll have, um, you know, you'll have uh, C Cs that are Unmethylated Cs that are that are typically much more highly methylated. Um, it's useful, as we have in this example, to have replicates to be able to see the level of variability. Um, so from this, you can definitely do um, single CPG analysis to identify positions that are differentially methylated. So you can do sort of standard uh, statistical tests to actually estimate. Um, you know, which ones based on, uh, you know, are higher in the cases uh, and get, you know, individual p-values associated with uh, individual CPGs in terms of methylation. Uh, what, what happens, uh, you know, typically what actually gets done is because there are, uh, there is uh, sometimes some variability at individual CPGs, so it's, it's also helpful or interesting to to look at regions as well, either using um, sort of a fixed window and tiling uh, style approaches where, again, you can basically identify regions that are differentially methylated um, between cases and control in this case, but it could be between two different tissues. Uh, or you could do also the same thing, but sort of inputting uh, specific regions of the genome uh, to ask whether you know, so if you have annotation maybe from an orthogonal uh, technologies about locations of, of enhancers and promoters, uh, you can really build uh, this type of map and then extract, again, from the individual uh, CPGs in those regions, whether there are regions that are. And it's just that, again, depending on, on your coverage, uh, and, and I'll get to that, but depending on your coverage, uh, you might not have very precise estimate of individual CPGs because, again, you need, you need to have multiple reads <coughs> covering the, the CPG to be able to have an accurate methylation state. So you might not have great resolution. Uh, you might not have very precise estimate of methylation status when you're looking at individual uh, CPGs. But once you start combining them in windows or in regions, you might have enough statistics to be able to, to make calls. Uh, what sort of tools do you use for, for To do the, the differential methylation uh, analysis? Are they specific to this context or any software? Yeah, so, so like I have one like this BS Smooth. So there's a number of, of tools. I think I had that in, in the initial slides as well in terms of different tools that, uh, that can do this differential methylation. Uh, again, one challenge is, well, so this, this highlights the fact that there's variability, but that's a standard thing, so there's variability between uh, different samples. Uh, so you have, uh, you might have sites that are, um, you know, so the, the, the amount of smoothing you need to do, uh, your resolution might also depend on the level of variability of the region. So you, you'll have some region, like this is highlighting a region in, in red, that's actually quite variable between the individuals. 
um, versus the region in, in, in Bloom that's a little bit more consistent. But, but again, having uh, replicates is, is, is needed uh, here. Um, this idea of, of not necessarily relying on the individual CPGs to make the call. Um, uh, so part of it is because, again, we talked about the fact that there might be a there might be a rare variant at a particular location that's throwing off the methylation estimates or something like that. So, so again, in some cases, the individual CPG uh, and then the estimates coming from single base pair might not be very reliable. But if you're really looking at uh, sort of a smoother profile from that data, you'll probably have uh, more robust detections of regions that are that are differentially methylated as opposed to to looking at individual, which again, for a number of reasons, including technical reasons associated with the mapping and, and various artifacts, uh, might throw off individual points on that, that point. So that's that's another reason to do some, some smoothing. Um, uh, but again, uh, so, so, so the hope is that, uh, you know, starting from uh, sort of the raw um, uh, methylation profile that you get uh, from, from the bisulfite sequencing, the genome bisulfite sequencing, uh, can, you, can you process this data to really identify, and that's one of the, the, the typical goal, regions that are differentially methylated, uh, for instance, between sample. Uh, so that's what you see here. So there's, this is an example in, in development, so similar to, to what we'll, you know, so different uh, cell stage. And you see that in the IPS, in the embryonic stem cell, you have uh, actually the lower methylation in these, in these regions. So these really sort of define some of these differential methylated uh, region. So whether it's between different cell stage, between different uh, cancer tumor stage, or different uh, tissues, as we were talking about, um, uh, so, so, so that, those are the types of, of comparisons that you would want to, to be doing using this, uh, this data. So, uh, so I've talked about this in the very beginning, and I, I said I would, I would get to that. Uh, in terms, I mean, one, one important question is what, what's the coverage that's uh, required? Uh, so, so this is an interesting uh, paper that, that really looked at this question in, in detail, and I think it's quite, quite helpful. So you see that uh, on the left side of this figure, you see that you've got different uh, replicates of the same cell type. Uh, so what they did is they did high, uh, high uh, coverage uh, whole genome by sulfide sequencing, and then they downsampled to see the effect of having uh, less coverage. Uh, so you see that the overall uh, correlation is good between the, the tissues and the replicates of the same cell type. Uh, but what happens if you start uh, downsampling a little bit? So one, one, uh, one nice thing to look at, for instance, is this one here. Uh, so you see that if you have, so this is where you increase coverage, and it determines what type of differentially methylated regions are able to pick up. So if you only have 1x or 1 to 5x coverage, uh, what you see is that the types of DMR that you're able to detect, differentially methylated regions, are these bigger DMRs, so DMRs that are in the range of 1 kb. So even if you have 1x coverage, you are able to detect some DMRs that are large and that tend to be highly different in terms of methylation. Um, as you increase coverage, uh, what you gain are, are more subtle regions that are differentially methylated, more subtle both in terms of the size, so you're able to go down to, to much tinier regions that are differentially methylated and, and where the effect uh, of the differences, the difference in methylation is also sort of smaller. So, so again, for some application, and, and you, you could argue that it's, you know, you pay a high cost to get, you know, just a little bit more information at some level uh, with, the, with the 30x uh, coverage. This is also sort of, you see this, um, so this is another sort of analysis looking at the false discovery rate. Uh, that decreases, as you would expect, as you increase coverage. Um, 
So, so this is just also, I mean, obviously the more coverage you have, the more accurate, the smaller the regions you can, you're able to detect, but it's a balance between cost and, and, and what you can, can afford to do. Uh, so, um, so I think I'm, I'm almost done, if not done. Um, Almost done. So, uh, conclusions. Um, so, so bisulfide sequence analysis is not uh, is not easy. Um, again, I, I call this sort of uh, advanced uh, bioinformatics.ca uh, module. Um, so, you need to choose the appropriate DNA methylation technology. So, hopefully, I gave you some some of the some some strategies to to pick what's appropriate uh, based based on on your mean. Uh, so you need to check for quality and watch for, for biases. So we touched on that a little bit, but that's really quite critical um, so, and, and really, really important. Uh, there's, there's the multi-step analysis workflow, which is really what we're going to be doing uh, in the lab. Uh, so, and just before we break, um, I guess, uh, a preview of what uh, you'll see uh, in, in, uh, in David's presentation, uh, but whether you have some of your own data or there's also lots of available data sets out there, uh, what we're going to be doing in the lab is really sort of a dumbed down version of one of these data sets that's, that's really much smaller such that the processing will be reasonable. Uh, another challenge, I guess, which I didn't even mention at all, is the fact that it's, especially with whole genome bisulfide sequencing, the processing is quite intensive because, again, you have all these extra steps of converting all your reads into these other reads, mapping multiple times, uh, you know, getting, you know, four alignments and then pulling them all together. So whole genome bisulfide sequencing, we're going to do a mini version that's really sort of restricted in some regions of the genome. Doing it with the full 30x data set is really computationally very intensive because of these, uh, the fact that you're doing multiple times. But uh, with that, I'll take, I guess, a few questions if you have any. Yeah. So, what kind of mapping is done? What kind of, I didn't quite get. Oh, smoothing. Uh, so there's, again, there's, um, I guess there's lots of different approaches for smoothing. Many of them are, are quite, um, you know, there's, so there's basic approaches that really don't do much except uh, having a sliding average, you know, as you're going through, uh, you know, combining multiple CTGs, whether you're actually, um, so I guess a very standard approach is really just use uh, a sliding windows, either fixed size or really, because of the density of CPG varies quite a bit, sliding windows on the number of CPG is also a, a popular smoothing approach. So five CPGs, and then you're, you have this sliding average as a smoothing strategy. But there's more advanced uh, smoothing strategy as well. Uh, but uh, yeah.